Hey, this is Jason Lee from JLM Real Estate. If you want to learn how to use your small axe to build an empire, you should be listening to the Small Axe Podcast with my good friend, Nico. Hey guys, it's your boy Nico here from the Small Axe Podcast. I want to show you how to use your small axe to build a lasting empire. You see, not everybody begins their investing career with millions of dollars, a huge network of investors, or the knowledge necessary to become successful in this space. And that's okay. What I focus on here on this podcast is helping you hone your skills, sharpen your tools to become the best investor that you can be. Now, I want you to sit back, relax, and enjoy this show. If you have any questions or you want to reach out to me or the guest, feel free to do so. Love you guys. All right, Small Axe community, welcome to another episode. And today, I'm hanging out with Jason Lee. And this is a cool dude, and you're really going to want to get to know him because he's on the flip side of things, as well as being an active multifamily real estate investor like us. He is also a broker. So Jason is a highly recognized real estate broker in the multifamily real estate industry. He's currently one of the top producing commercial real estate agents in, in San Diego. His transactions and insights have bit, have even been shared on this in the San Diego Business Journal and CoStar. Big news, man. In the last couple of years, Jason has represented over 75 investors and sold over $150 million worth of real estate in San Diego County. Not only is Jason prominent, but also a very active multifamily investor himself. So he has acquired over 15 properties in the past 12 months. Man, that is incredible, first of all. He is the owner operator of over $30 million worth of real estate in San Diego County, totaling just over 65 units. So let's get him on. Jason, how's it going, man? Good, good. How about you, Nico? Doing great. Feeling good. Uh, summer is upon us here in New York, so I am happy. <clears throat> nice. Yeah, the weather's been kind of um, weird this year in California. It's been all of June and May. We haven't had like one sunny day. It's just been cl clouds. Crazy. Uh, ah, all right. Okay. Well, look, better times are ahead then right we can only look look at the uh, positive when it when uh what do they say april showers bring may flowers so it's going to be nice down the road yep definitely definitely all right jason so i went very high level over your bio and there's some really great stuff in there maybe you could take a couple of minutes to kind of walk through your journey and how you got to where you are today yeah so i started in the business you know when i was young i, I started when i was only 20 years old and I started right away as a commercial real, real estate agent at my old company here in San Diego, a small little multifamily boutique shop uh, close to downtown San Diego. And I was blessed to meet such an amazing uh, mentor or mentor, should I say, at that company. All the senior brokers there were super willing to help me. My direct mentor slash senior broker was amazing, taught me the entire business. And before that, I was you know, just a lost college kid, didn't know what I was going to do. Parents wanted me to go to medicine, wanted me to go to grad school. That would have been the worst path for me. So anything to not do that path was fine for me. So um, yeah, so in 2018, I got my license and I started full-time when I was still a full-time student and um, eventually got to the point to where I could do transactions on my own, didn't need anyone else to kind of help or support me. So I thought it was time to kind of start my own team, brand myself in 2021. And that's when I started JLM Real Estate here in San Diego as well. And up to this point, now we have about 10 agents working working with me. And um, on, on the other side of that, I spent about half my time focusing on investments as well. Wow, man. Congratulations. That's Those are major moves and they're really quick. Uh, very impressive stuff, man. Okay. So you built a business on the acquisition side through a brokerage firm, and you're also acquiring multifamily properties for yourself to own as an owner operator. All right, let's unpack a little bit, a bit, a little bit about that. Where do you want to start with the uh, brokerage side? Sure. Yeah, whatever you want. All right. So how is it transacting over there in California, San Diego in particular? It's a great question. A lot of people have negative things to say about buying and selling in California, but I completely understand from a San Francisco and Los Angeles standpoint, those core cities, it's very it's very tough to make money and to execute the business plan you want to execute. But San Diego is still 
I mean, it, it's getting there, but um, it's still, you know, friendly enough for landlords to be able to do their thing and, you know, make money and do value add business plans. So um, the last five, six years in San Diego, the market's been very hot. It's cooled down this year in 2023 a little bit, but um, overall, there's still a lot of buying power, buying pressures in San Diego. We're not seeing like the big dips here, like most cities um, that are kind of the same tier markets. Like we have an out, you know, an hour flight to Vegas, hour flight to Phoenix. Those markets are getting hit pretty tough, but San Diego has been pretty, pretty sturdy of a market. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so it's funny, even in New York here, um, not landlord friendly, right? And I know some investors that are very successful. <clears throat> so it's just, I guess, you know, there's, there's a business plan and a way to go about buying real estate anywhere. And I think San Diego is a beautiful uh, place and it's always going to be attractive for people to live in. And that's important. We need, we need people to live there. So um, yeah, so why do you love San Diego County? Yeah, I mean, I think the reason why I like San Diego County for real estate investing, of course, personally, there's so much to do, right? I mean, there's surfing, there's amazing golf. Uh, the weather, mo for the most part, is really great. Great hikes, amazing beaches. So on a personal level, there's just so many things to do. That's why so many people during the pandemic wanted to move to San Diego in the first place. And that's why the rents really boomed here. But from an investment standpoint, purely, I like San Diego because it's a landlocked city. So you know, to the west, you have the ocean. To the east, you have mountains and deserts. Um, to the south, you have the border, which is, you know, Mexico. And then to the north, you have Camp Pendleton. So San Diego is very, is very landlocked. And you can't really build much more housing unless you build up. And that's why um, San Diego as an investor, it's so good to own because when there's no supply for housing, you know, rents go up, prices go up. So that's why so many investors that I have are still bullish on the overall long-term growth of San Diego. Yeah, great, great response. And as an investor, let's say I was, I was coming to you looking for deals. Is there the same amount of competition as there was a year ago? Uh, has it turned to be finally a buyer's market or has that not happened yet? How, how are things on the transaction end? Yeah, that's a great question. For your first, for the first part of the answer, definitely less competition at this point. In 2021 and early 2022, when rates were at all time lows, um, I'm sure you know in any market the competition was crazy. But at this point in time, there are a lot of buyers that have exited the market that are kind of waiting to see what happens. So I've seen some, you know, smart, intelligent buyers get some really good deals at this point in the market. That being said, it's still, I mean, deals are still trading. There's still a good amount of buyers, decent amount of sellers. So the, the playing field is more even now. It's definitely not a buyer's market, but it's definitely going towards that way um, and could go that way further if rates stay up or rise, which they probably won't because only we saw with CPI came in at 4% today, which is great. But um, if rates did go up, I'm sure the market would keep slowing down. Yeah. Uh, so the, yeah, the Fed today, so this is June 14th. They met today. They decided to pause or, or kick the can down the road and maybe do one more hike in, Ju in July or so. But I, look, I'm bullish on real estate. I'm bullish on, on, on multifamily. And, and I am confident that market cycles happen and things are going to get better. I, and I think right now is a perfect buying opportunity. I think that there are deals to be had. You're telling me people are trading still, and, and that gets me excited. I love that. I wanted to ask you, though, is it challenge, or what challenges are you facing today, maybe that you didn't face a year ago in a transaction to help buyers get to the finish line? Yeah, I think the um, a lot of challenges, but I think the biggest challenge is just like the the difference between what sellers want for their property and what buyers are want to pay. It's been a lot harder to put deals together for that reason. The bid ask spread is pretty wide right now, at least in San Diego. Sellers still think that um, they're on their high horse. They have they don't have much motivation because so many owners here have a lot of equity. There's not a lot of pain. So when there's no pain, sellers have no reason to sell. So they're just keeping their prices up. And it's been like this huge like standstill battle between um, you know who's going to pay less, who's going to pay more, 
um, where the chips are going to fall. So that's probably been the toughest thing this year is just trying to get a meeting of the minds between the buyer and the seller. Well, it's, it's funny you say that. So I, like I try to see all angles, you know, what I, I work with brokers, you know, and I love working with brokers, but I don't envy their job and their position because they have to negotiate with the buyer, with the seller, and they have to come to an agreement. And sometimes the buyers are super stubborn and they walk. Sometimes the sellers are stubborn and they're not going to sell and they hold on to it. And that's just the way it goes. Um, it's funny, man. And, and I'm really finally now three and a half years into my personal journey. I'm, I'm trying to understand everybody's role. And I feel like that's going to make me a better overall investor down the road. Um, have, how is like, do you have an in-house debt team or do you guys help people, uh, you know, finance these, these properties? Um, we have a couple people doing it. That's kind of a newer vertical in our business, but I understand debt very well. Financing, um, you know, is definitely a different beast, but for the most part, if it's a tougher deal, tougher loan, um, we usually kind of refer it out to our referral partners in the area. Okay. And it's, it's, and do you like, um, when somebody comes to you, like, let's say Jason, I have a deal. Sorry, my dog is barking. Let's say I have, I have like a, a 20 unit building that I want to sell and I'm bringing it to you. What, and I'm going to ask you for your, your guidance on what do you think it's worth and how are you going to market it and that kind of stuff? What is that process like? And I'm just asking you purely from a curiosity standpoint at this point, because I know I also want to get to your active side as well, but this is very interesting for me because I don't have many brokers on here either. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. So if, if you came to me with a 20 unit building and you wanted to know how much it would sell for, um, I guess th the process is actually very simple. So I would meet with you and I would bring sales comparisons of the recent sales in your market within, I'd say, you know, three to five mile radius is the best. And then, um, if, if, if it's a 20 unit building, I obviously wouldn't compare it to much bigger properties or much smaller properties. So I'd probably pick comps in between like 10 to 30 units, probably the best. And then from there, we would go over kind of the metrics of what buildings are selling for in the area, what the cap rate is, what the GRM is, um, go over the averages with you. And then I would, of course, um, try to get interior photos from you to see, you know, how, how old is the renovation? Because a lot of owners say they renovated the property, but usually they might have renovated it like 15 years ago. So they still have like old carpet in there. So until we see photos and a rent roll, real financials, and then bringing a full market, you know, CMA analysis, it's kind of tough to, um, analyze a property just from one angle. So we kind of take the approach of analyzing from multiple angles because I know some people just say, you know, it's based on cap rate. It's just based on uh, price per door, but there's so many different metrics to analyzing a property. So we kind of use a well-rounded approach. Um, how many bedroom baths per unit, how old, you know, what's the vintage? Was it 1980s, 1990s? Because newer product will sell for more. Um, you know, is it renovated, not renovated? And just, questions like that just to see what kind of property we're looking at. And then we'll, you know, kind of meet at a number if the seller is reasonable. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, do you rely on, or better question, where is your favorite data? Like where, where do you get your data from? Because what, so like, I love CoStar. I love uh, looking at these, these, you know, companies with all this data but sometimes I find some of them dated, especially if we're in a market that is that really exploded over over you know the course of twelve months or so. I feel that it can be dated. Do you have any tips for us to find accurate or recent data? Yeah, um, it's a great question. So, yeah, CoStar is a great source to find data, but it can be dated because I think they update like every six months to a year. They're trying to get better at that, but yeah, like when the market boomed in twenty twenty one, it kind of wasn't keeping with pace. But that's probably the best national data provider. But we also use a lot of like local statistics. Um, there's a there should be some sort of housing analyst in every city. Ours is called Sandag, uh, San Diego Housing Analysts, and they come out with great stats on job reports. You know, population growth, uh, rent growth, um, supply overall, how many houses, how many apartments are on the market. So that's what I use, and I use CoStar, but um, other than that, like, you know, the government comes out with a lot of, you know, great job reports and stuff like that. So 
those those are my main two. Beautiful. Now, as flipping it a little bit, as an active investor, what do you typically look for? And I know that you are investing in San Diego, San Diego County as well, which kind of makes sense. I mean, you're you're you know everything about San Diego County from all perspectives as a buyer and a seller and brokering deals. So, what do you look for as a buyer? Yeah, as a buyer, actually, um, it, I, I've kind of switched. So when I first started, I only looked for uh, properties I could, you know, add a lot of value to through renovations, through adding units, you know, parking, washer and dryer, whatever it is, to try to increase the overall gross income of the property. Um, so that's how we kind of grew our portfolio. I started out small. Um, San Diego has a lot of like mom and pop type apartments, like a lot of like four plexes, eight plexes, 10 plexes. So that's where I got my start and ended up trading up doing 1031 exchanges into larger assets. And then now um, there's a huge opportunity in San Diego right now to develop and to build more units. There's a lot of uh, favorable laws to add to more housing supply because California is so constrained on housing. So there's a lot of favorable laws for density, especially in the city of San Diego. So we've been buying a lot of like single family lots with big, huge backyards and adding eight to 10 units on the back of it. So that's kind of been my um, forte lately, my kind of buy box, you could say. Man, that is so cool. I really wish, so I really wish we could do that here in New York, man. I, uh, I Maybe laws will change in the future, but I really like that model. Um, and so it's helpful because people need a place to live. People need affordable places to live. People are downsizing in general, I feel. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's super trendy to get like, let's say the, the tiny homes or these micro units. It's, it's trendy, it's fun, and it serves a, a real need for people, let's say 20 to 30 years old. Oh, I, and I think it's a great model, man. No, definitely. Um, it, it's a great little niche because the big institutions aren't really chasing it. So it's kind of a mom and pop private investor market. So uh, it's been great. The competition has been a lot smaller than other larger assets. What kind of um, challenges are there? Are there? Is there any development? Is there any upfront costs? Are the loans the same? Like what kind of challenges do you face? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, yeah, the, the biggest challenge, excuse me, the biggest challenge is that, um, as you know, if you do a value add business plan, you can just you know, renovate it in three, four, six months maximum and put it back on the market for rents. But for development uh, in California, at least, I know other states are a lot quicker, but to get your permits process to actually start breaking ground, uh, demolishing the current structure to build, it takes anywhere from a year to two years, depending on the size of the project to actually start. So you have to underwrite for a pretty large carry. So, you know, your mortgage costs, if you get high leverage, and just got to stay accountable for um, the increase in development costs because, um, you know, in, in general right now, construction costs are still rising. So when you start breaking ground, your construction costs one to two years out might be higher than what you projected. So you got to have like a large 10 to 15% contingency in place to make sure that you have a little gap between um, construction costs today and maybe what they might be tomorrow. So those are two challenges that we faced. And of course, when you do ground up development, it's just a lot more labor, right? So you're dealing with a lot more things that can go wrong. You're not just putting lipstick on a pig on a unit anymore. You're building, you know, brand new homes, brand new apartments. So a lot of things can go wrong with the city. Uh, a lot of things can get delayed. So yeah, it's, it's just a more of a tougher process. Wow. Thanks, Jason. Really interesting. Um, I love this, man. This is a great conversation. Can I, I want to, uh, Circle back for a second because I missed this question and I don't want to forget it. What is a typical price per door if we're looking at a multifamily uh, building? Typical price per door in San Diego, San Diego County, B or C class? I don't know. You pick. Yeah, I would say like middle of the pack, decent location in San Diego, um, class B area, class B building. Right now, I'd say the average is like three fifty to four hundred thousand a unit. Okay. And um, do rents support that or rents around 35 or? Rents, rents, <laughs> it's a good question. Rents are definitely, depending on what kind of building you're buying, but if you're bu building a, bu if you're buying a building on the market, probably not going to pencil. It's tough to 
find a building that pencils in San Diego on the market right now. There are some few and far in between, but um, San Diego is notorious for being a low cash flow market. So in order to get cash flow, in order to get a lot of yield, you have to buy a value add or a development deal for it to make sense. Yeah, I got you. Now, since things are pricier than, let's say, like Oklahoma, um, I do you raise capital or how do like do you have investors? Do you syndicate deals? Yeah, so um, recently we have been, uh, but for the first like um, two, three years that I was buying real estate, uh, it was just me and my partner putting in uh, money 50 50. And then, so I would take all my commissions, put it into that. And then um, we'd get pretty high leverage because my partner was a hard money, uh, like a hard money debt fund guy. So we would get like, you know, 80%, sometimes even 85% leverage on these deals. Uh, flip them, you know, either sell them or refinance them. So we were able to kind of leverage uh, skill sets from both angles. You know, me, I was finding deals. He was, you know, helping finance them. So it was a great partnership to start. And today are you, are you, or do you ever plan on like syndicating deals? Oh yeah. Yeah. So we have, uh, so for our recent development deals, we have syndicated. So we have some family and friends who want to invest with us. So it's all just been like people we know in our network that just asked us or wanted to know more about what we're doing. And yeah, for the development stuff or like the heavy value add stuff recently, we have uh, raised some capital from friends. Cool. And so what is your ultimate end goal? Or, or are you just going to continue kicking butt in real estate the way you're doing? Or do you have a vision? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I, think, I, I think the vision that I want to have is just having a, a group of people that I, that I enjoy working with. Um, it's a great company culture that, you know, is more than a company. It's like my friends, everyone I work with at my company right now, or my partners are all good friends of mine. So just wanting to grow the number of great connections that I have and just trying to take down more deals day by day. Yeah, man, that's incredible. Um, all right. So this, this, um, this next year, let's say, uh, are you going to do any more of those, uh, you know, single family purchases where you're going to be building out and developing part of it, or are you going to focus more on traditional multifamily? Or are you going to do different development or what's the focus for this next year? Yeah. For next year, I think I'll be, a, I think I'll be opportunistic. I think whatever comes my way, if it makes sense, if the opportunity uh, pencils, then I'll go after it. So don't really have a specific, um, buy box. I'll do value add development. Um, even looked at some, you know, commercial properties, um, in the area. So if, if the numbers make sense and if the risk is, you know, lower than the upside, then we'll take a hard look at it usually. Yeah. Any thoughts on, um, uh, office and con doing office conversions or is that not feasible? I heard that there's a very few percentage of the buildings that would actually convert well, or, you know, be pot be potentially, convertible yeah. yeah here um that's definitely a possibility but a lot of people are actually looking to just demolish office buildings and on large lots and just start start from the ground up and develop multifamily. i know some groups that are chasing those kind of properties right now that i work with that are my clients so that's definitely happening um if if your office building is not well located right now no matter what city you're at uh you're probably struggling uh i just you know today this morning went to my banker and uh, he works in downtown in a class A office building and basically like almost every unit is vacant. It's crazy. Um, so yeah, office is definitely struggling right now. But on the other side, if you look at industrial though, industrial properties on the commercial end are doing very well. Overall in San Diego, there's like a 3% vacancy factor. It, everything's leased out and cap rates are still pretty low. So that's another very strong, stable asset um, in the country as well. Oh, uh, interesting. And you brought up the, the my, one of my favorite words, cap rate. Can you talk a little bit about cap rates in San Diego, maybe where they were and where they are? Yeah, San Diego cap rates right now, or, you know, actually going back, you're going to laugh at this, but when the interest rates were at the lowest, um, there were some properties by the beach that were trading for like low two, like low three caps, high two caps that are yeah. like class A, you know, by the beach properties. Yeah. But now we're not seeing anything like below a four cap. So 
um, for like class A, we're seeing like four caps for class C we're seeing like six, six and a half caps, even in like the lesser tertiary kind of rougher markets. And then, um, class B we're seeing anywhere from four to 5%, depending on where it's located. Yeah. Same in Florida, man. I saw sub three <laughs> at the height, you know, and that's just the way it is. People are willing to pay them that, you know, debt was cheap. You can get high leverage. Uh, rents were crazy. There were, there was like, you know, 16 plus even 30% rent growth in some places. I mean, it made sense at this point though, it's the times have changed a little bit. So that's why I think that it, with this quick change there, this is an opportunity, right? So if we're buying, if we were buying at a three cap a year ago, now we're buying at a four, four and a half cap. That is a, that's a discount. If the world is going to go back to that three cap, which I think it will eventually. Definitely. Yeah. I, I think it can go back there. I mean, you never know. Everyone says different things, but I, I definitely see rates coming down in the near, I mean, not the near future, but like, Maybe like, you know, one to two years. I agree. Well, Jason, I really appreciate this conversation today. Uh, I, I learned a lot from you on both sides, the, the brokerage side, as well as the multifamily investor side, the developer side. So thank you so much for this conversation. And I know that my listeners are going to want to reach out to you. So I want to get them your contact information. But before we get there, let's hit you. I'm going to hit you with this question. Jason, let's imagine it was 100 years from now. You have great grandchildren and they are super happy running around wealthy owning land and development properties in san diego they want to write a book about you what would you want them to title this book uh i, I would say you know I, I was thinking about this before we started talking but i think i think the book would be um should be called um the person, you know, who wasn't afraid to try new things, because I think that um, if you don't try new things and you're scared of failing and you're scared of what people think about you, you're never going to be able to get to the next level in life. So I've always lived my life around, you know, try new things. If it interests me, go for it. If I don't like it, you know, stop. But even when it comes to running a business, um, one of my greatest business mentors told me, that's, you know, ran fortune 500 companies. He said that if you aren't, you know, trying, if you aren't failing, you're not trying enough strategies to grow your business. So, um, I, I thought that was really profound and I've lived my life, you know, behind, you know, just going for it, trying new things, if it can potentially benefit me and worrying about the upside more than the risk. Oh, Jason, I love it, man. That is cool. And really, really great advice and guidance and an awesome way to live your life. And I bet you your parents are super proud of you now, even though you're not a doctor, which is not necessarily the path for everybody. I think that's phenomenal, man. You're a kicking butt. Let's uh, let's get the listeners some form of contacting you. Yeah, best way is email me or message me on Instagram. My email is jason at jlmrealestateinc.com or my full name on Instagram is Jason Joseph Lee. Awesome, man. So again, it's been an awesome pleasure uh, talking with you today. I'm really happy we connected and I can't wait to continue these conversations because you're a knowledgeable and go-getter kind of guy. So thank you. All right. Hey, Small Axe community. I would like to say thank you for listening to another episode of my podcast where we show you how to use your small axe to build a lasting empire. Now, if you liked what you heard, it would mean the world to me if you would subscribe, leave a five-star rating, and write a review. Also, if you want to get in touch with me, go to my website at smallaxcommunities.com. Book a call with me. And until the next episode, keep sharpening those axes.